secție specială a emisiunii Calea Adevărul și Viața. Astăzi, așadar, vom vorbi despre Israel. Avem un invitat special din Israel. Uh, welcome, uh, Zef Pora, to just tell to our viewers that we have a, a special program today uh, and you will be our guest. Zef Porat este un evreu mesianic din Tel Aviv. So, Zef Porat, I just uh, mentioned that, that you are here in Romania to be part of uh, an event that we organize every year, Prayer for Israel. Uh, tell us um, more about you, a few things about you at the beginning, because uh, during the next uh, almost one hour we share, you will share our, your testimony with our viewers. First of all, I'm very happy to be here in uh, Romania, sharing uh, the love of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, to all the world, all the nations. Um, God has called me to not only to come to Romania, but to share the love of Yeshua everywhere in the world. And this is uh, what I believe is a blessing from this Bible. So I know during our conversation, um, probably will be one program today and one program will be uh, in the next uh, next week. Uh, you'll, uh, at the end of our discussion, people understand more what's about um, uh, the Jewish, Messianic Jewish, uh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. But for, uh, for the beginning, few short uh, ideas about what means to be a Messianic Jewish. What is the difference between a Messianic Jewish and a Christian? It's a difference, it's not a Christian. Something very short. Well, it's a very big difference because in, in God's eyes, there's no difference. We're all the same. But uh, living in Israel, if uh, any Christian was to come to visit Israel and, you know, say that he's a Christian, he wouldn't have a problem with uh, the Israeli people. At the most, they wouldn't listen to him, but nobody would be upset with him. He would not be persecuted. But as an Israeli born in Israel and also a Jew, speaking about Yeshua and becoming a believer, you, there's anger, there's certain anger from the Israeli people. Uh, they view you as a um, as a traitor. They view you as a uh, a person who who stabbed him in the back. I personally have been called many times worse than a terrorist. People told me that that a terrorist that blows up buses is better than you. This is what my own people told me. So it's there is a difference because a Messianic Jew um, is a Christian. But why are we Messianic Jews? Because when you're born a Jew, a Jew. You cannot convert. Convert to what? To anything. You, you're, you, you're born a Jew, you die a Jew. But a real Jew believes in Yeshua the Messiah. This is a real, this is a real Jew. This is... Um, Talking about the Jewish people, we think, oh, Jewish people are believers. They believe in God. They are God's people. They are special people selected by God. So uh, you say believer, because, but Jewish people, they believe in God. Uh, they believe in God, but they don't have the right perspective on the Bible. They don't believe in the, in the Messiah. And, and the Bible from Genesis all through the Old Testament, everything points to the Messiah, everything. And they don't see this for many reasons. One reason is the rabbi. The rabbi is a leader of the Jewish people. The spiritual leader. He is a spiritual leader, yes. There are many rabbis. Each congregation has their own rabbi. And there are main rabbis of... Uh, of uh, each country or each, each city, I would say. Like main rabbi of Tel Aviv, main rabbi. And people look up to the rabbis in, uh, in Israel. It's absolutely of, normal to, to follow the spiritual leader of the community. It is, but the spiritual leader is not someone who reads the Bible. It's someone that interprets the Bible by his own wisdom, not by God's wisdom. And, uh, and then we have a problem because each rabbi has a different interpretation. So nobody gets the same message from the Bible. Everybody gets a different message from the, from the scripture. Yes. We find more about this, but uh, let's start to talk about your testimony. I know you, are, you came from a f rabbi family. You mentioned about the rabbi, but you, your father, your grandfather was a rabbi. Tell us more about the, your background. Well, um, I grew up in a very orthodox family. Or Jew Jewish orthodox Jewish orthodox, orthodox family, yes. My father was a rabbi. My, his father, my grandfather was a rabbi. And my ancestors were Dayans. Dayans means judges of rabbis in the Hebrew language. Uh, I'll explain a little bit what a judge of a rabbi is. If you were to go to a court of law, you go to a, you know, a civil court of law. Orthodox people go to a rabbinic, to a rabbinic court of law. And uh, if there was any problem, conflict between two rabbis or conflict between a synagogue, 
they would take it to the judges of the rabbis. And this was my family. They were actually uh, the ones who made the final decisions on what the rabbinics will uh, do. Uh, small, even things like, do you have meat and milk six hours between meat and milk or five hours? They would decide what to do. Can a, uh, can a Jew fast in uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? Or can he not fast? The rabbi would decide this. So he basically had um, the authority, like, you know, I'm not going to say that he said he was God, but people viewed that. So you came from a very important uh, rabbi branch, I would say. Uh, I, I came from a very important, uh, very important branch, but God used it in, in my favor. Okay, and probably your, your parents, your family put in your heart uh, the, the Judaism uh, values. The, how, um, how you grew up? What do you, what you have in your mind from that time? Well, I grew up, uh, I was born in Israel. And uh, at a very small age, my parents uh, went to America because my father was offered a job as a main rabbi in a uh, congregation, Kadima, which is located in California. And he was also the uh, principal of that day school. So I grew up there as a, as a boy. And growing up as a boy, I remember my father had a giant library at home, something very big. I don't think that this wall over here would cover it. Many and books. Many rabbi books. And I, uh, I asked my father as a boy several times, if you're a rabbi, why do we have rabbi books? Can't you just teach me the Bible? The scripture, because they have the scripture, few books in the scripture. Yeah, because you're a rabbi, you obviously, according to Judaism, are, uh, are blessed to understand this. And he said that the rabbis in the books are more anointed than he is, and we must follow the rabbi books. So I never remember actually opening the Bible itself, but I always opened a book that was written about the Bible. But to have a Bible, Old and New Testament, somewhere at home, or so you had already? An Old Testament never had, we had an Old Testament at home, but we never opened it. It was just there like a picture. We just study everything from rabbi books. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the mistake. This is, uh, I would say, the enemy's main tool is to get people to read the books and not the Bible. So they don't find the truth. So you, you lived in California uh, for many years as a teenager, and only one education, or let's say religious education, was from the rabbi sources. Yes. Uh, you but know, in your city probably was a lot of Christian churches, different denominations. I know California, it's... Uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of Christian churches. And uh, one time I remember leaving school, my father had uh, um, seen us trying to get books from some Christians that they were outside the school and tracks and he came out and he was very angry at the students and at me and he said do not take anything that has to do with Jesus because he said like this the God will be very angry with you and you as a Jewish person may lose your salvation so you know hearing this from you know not only the main rabbi of the congregation but your own father I was scared and you know I grew up in California but I was isolated from any hearing anything in the gospel, because uh, my father warned me about this. So, it's amazing how you can be in the center of, you know, very... Uh, the Christian civilization. Christian civilization, but you're isolated. So, so as you are afraid of anything that is connected with, uh, with Christianity? I was very much afraid. I believe that God will punish me if I would even read it. So if I ever turned the TV on or something and there was something about Jesus, I would, uh, you know, if my father would even hear anything about Jesus, he would get very angry. So <clears throat> this was the atmosphere that you grew up. And how long did you stay in the United States and when you came back in Israel? Well, I came back to Israel because my father passed away in the United States. And by his request, he requested to be buried in Israel. So we had transferred him to Israel. And he's buried in a cemetery called Ponovich, which is the most religious uh, cemetery in the center of Israel, in the city of Bnei Brak, which is a religious Orthodox city. And I mentioned that my grandfather was also a rabbi. He continued, he, he still was alive when my father passed away. So we buried him over there. And um, I don't know if people have ever heard of Rabbi Shach. He was one of the biggest rabbis in Israel. He's buried in that cemetery and Rabbi Weinberg so and my father is just four or five graves away from there. So you need to understand how, uh, um, how you know, 
special for the Jewish people this cemetery is. So only to mention a few things about the United States, um, you grew up in a Christian civilization and how was it with your food then in that time? You have your own uh, community completely isolated. You know, that's really amazing because even growing up in, in the States, I had problems as a Jew before I was a believer. Because, you know, um, I went to the day school in my father's school and that was only till uh, junior high. In junior high, I had to go to another school and my father sent me to downtown Los Angeles to a very, very religious school. And they wanted me to wear, you know, like the black Orthodox clothes and, the, you know, the grow a beard and everything. But um, I went there for a week and I told my father that I just can't, I can't handle it. It's too much for me. It was, it was too much. So we didn't have a, you know, he didn't have a choice. I ended up going to public school. And I went to public school. I didn't have very much friends because they viewed me as strange. Because when they used to go out in the evening, I could never go out with them because, because you know, Zev can't eat this, he can't eat that, that's not kosher, he can't go with us. So they used to tell me, you know, just go with us and have a glass of water or something. And I was afraid because if my father even knew that I stepped in these places, he would really, really be angry with me. So I had a hard time being even a Jew in, in, in America because of that reason. Okay. Tell us more, <clears throat> getting closer to your conversion time. The relation with your father, your father passed away, you came back, your, your grandfather was still alive. Tell us how was your relation with the religious leader, with your grandfather? Or Well, my, relig my relationship with my grandfather was excellent. You know, he, he basically replaced my father. He, to me, he was a father. You know, he was just like my father. We uh, spent a lot of time together, a lot of study together. And, you know, he really wanted me to become a rabbi. He said, you must continue the family route. You know a lot of Bible, you study a lot your whole life. And, uh, and I, I think I really maybe wanted to become a rabbi at a lot of period of my life. And, but you know, as the years passed, I felt something empty in my heart. And I started to drift away from religion, slowly, slowly, and I became something between secular to traditional, I would say. And I, I went to the Israeli army. I served in the IDF and the Air Force. And eventually, after a few years after the army, I started to do what a lot of young people do. I started to go out to pubs, you know, drinking alcohol, going to discotheques, and uh, doing everything that we see today in the secular world. And you know, that didn't fill my emptiness either. I did it for many years. It was still something empty in me. Eventually, years passed and the internet came along. And I started to use the internet. Um, I was going in many places in the internet. I don't want to get into the uh, places like many young people. You, like many young people, you know, Romania, you are, could be places that were not were not supposed to be in. And uh, one time I was in a chat room. I used to go to chat rooms a lot. And a young man from California, it was uh, amazing the way the Lord did it, uh, asked me where I'm from, and I said Israel. And through, internet, internet. through the internet, through a chat Chatting room, yes. Room. And when he heard Israel, he started to talk to me about God. And, you know, I really didn't want to hear it because I came to the Internet because I had enough of religion my whole life. I came here for something else. And here this guy is, you know, talking to me about God. And, you know, I understand right now that you can't run away from God. God will catch you in the Internet. He'll catch you wherever, he needs to be, wherever you need to be found. You can't run away from God. And um, for four years, this man, Todd, was speaking to me on the Internet. And, you know, I could have easily deleted him, but I, I you know, I just kept on listening to him. And deleted from the, the list yeah, of if I would just delete him and I don't have to listen to him anymore. Why would I want to listen to this man for four years? And eventually what happened is I understand now the Holy Spirit was working on me. But he tried to talk to me about the, you know, the New Testament. And I said, look, I'm Jewish and really I can't talk about New Testament. The New Testament, please understand it, respect it. And this is something that I would like to explain to the audience. Um, if you're ever in Israel or you're talking to a Jewish person, it would be a lot better to use the Old Testament because they view the uh, New Testament as a, uh, even as an offense, like they view a cross as an offense. And part of it's because of the history of the Jewish people, because of the Crusades and... Uh, what was done to them in the Holocaust in the name of Christians, 
it was only in the name of Christians, but they don't understand that. So they view a, a cross or the New Testament as an offense. So I, I, I wanted to do everything in the Old Testament, which is fine, because the Old Testament is full of, uh, full of enough evidence here about, you know, about Yeshua. And your friend Todd from, from, internet, from the Internet, he mm -hmm. had this wisdom to, to yeah. use the only Old Testament to introduce you uh, to the, the Christianity, to introduce Jesus to you. You know, God sent the right person to me. God sent the right person. God knows how to orchestrate everything. And, you know, I would say after about a year and eight months of listening to this guy and uh, giving me various verses and chapters in the Old Testament, um, there's something moving in my heart. And I was struggling, and then I decided to go and in, to investigate. I went to um, libraries, I went to study in a religious perspective and also in a historical perspective perspective. About Messiah, about Jesus. No, just about, about the, the Bible, first of all. About not about Jesus, about the Bible. What's the truth in the Bible? You know, because I'm used to rabbi books, and here I am actually investigating the Bible itself, leaving the rabbi books aside. And I found that there are gaps between what I learned, what Todd was telling me on the internet, and what is written in the Bible. And then I really decided to go to, you know, to rabbis as well. First rabbi I went to was my grandfather. For advice, so for yeah, clarification. I, I had questions. I had questions. I didn't know. And I went to my grandfather, and I never told my grandfather that, you know, I'm studying about the Messiah or anything. I just asked him uh, various uh, verses in the Bible, like, for example, from the Old Testament. The Old Testament. I asked him, like, in Genesis, why it says that God let us make man in our, in our image. Why is our plural? And um, I asked him about Isaiah 7:14. It talks about a virgin. And, you know, I, I did an historical uh, research on that because, you know, in the English translation it says um, virgin. About the, 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 yes, the Mary. Yes, about the, the Mary in 714. In Hebrew it says the word Alma. The word Alma is translated in English to maiden or young lady. And I was a little bit troubled by this because... You know, here you are saying, the English says virgin, but the Hebrew doesn't say virgin, it says Alma. So this was my struggle. And then I started to do research, what does Alma mean? And I found that in the old, in, uh, at the old time, at, at that time where, where, when Jesus was, was born, the language Hebrew, Alma, meant young lady, which meant virgin at that time. So I knew it was a virgin. And I, I asked my grandfather this question. And my grandfather, I, I guess he knew the direction I was going in, and he started to get upset with my questions. Now, the more he got upset, the more I was drawing away from Judaism, closer to the Messiah. Because I knew my grandfather was not an upset person. He never got upset. And this made him upset. And eventually what I did, I, in a period of two years and eight months, I spoke to 32 rabbis from all sectors in Israel. Um, Yamane, um, um, you know, Orthodox, conservative, Reform. And you, and put, you put them tough questions about uh, from the Old Testament. I just asked questions about the Old Testament, many questions. That, but connected with, uh, with the Messiah. With, uh, connected with what Todd was teaching me yes. on the Internet. Yes, with the Messiah. And I received 26 different answers from 32 rabbis. And that really confused me because I started to realize that my whole life was a lie. I was living a lie. Everything that I learned, everything I studied was wrong. And it was really painful for me because I knew that my father was wrong. And he wasn't alive anymore and I couldn't share this with him anymore. He wasn't here to ask him the questions. And eventually I met the main rabbi of Israel. Now his name is Israel Lau. How, how you get to, to have a, a time with him because I was probably a busy person or... It's almost impossible to get an appointment with him, but because my family is a rabbinic family and he knew my family, I told the secretary who I am and she asked him and he agreed to meet me. He didn't know why, but he, because of this he agreed to meet me. It happened years ago probably. Yes. So I met him and I asked him, you know, I said I went to, I met 32 rabbis and I received 26 different answers, and this is the Bible. I, I, I took the same Bible that I received in the IDF. In Israel, every soldier that is drafted to the army gets a Bible. Bible means in your language, Old Testament. Tanakh, Old Testament. Tanakh. Yes, Just not the Tanakh, because in Romania, Bible means Old Testament and 
Um, no, we received the Old Testament. It's called Hatanach, which is the five books of Moses and the prophecies. And I took this Bible to him, and I asked him the questions from the Bible that... Uh, uh, and before I spoke to him, I said, look, this is the Bible I received from the army. I wanted him to understand that this is the, you know, the Bible that is acceptable. And I asked him, I received 26 different answers. Isn't there one Bible? And he basically told me what other rabbis said. There are 70 faces to the Bible, which means there are 70 answers. And his answers were not very convincing. And I knew that, the, I, I knew that you know, the Messiah was, was Yeshua, Jesus, from born in Bethlehem and from Nazareth. I knew it. But I was in denial I, because I was afraid, you know, because as I mentioned earlier in the program, I was Jewish. I was afraid of losing my family. I was afraid of losing my, my heritage, you know. Your identity, in fact. My identity. So there was a struggle, and Satan was using that, you know, using that to, you know, to get a hold on me. But what I suppose was a battle in your mind, in, in, in your internal being, knowing that you have to live in a Jewish uh, environment and uh, having questions without answers. Yes, it was. But, you know, God showed me through the Bible that Jesus was a Jew and uh, uh, the Jewish holidays and everything he, he you know, he observed. And me, me uh, turning to the Messiah and accepting him as my personal savior doesn't mean that I'm not a Jew. I, you know, I, I was born a Jew and I will die a Jew. Um, in fact, a real Jew is, is believing in the Messiah. This is a real Jew. And Jesus himself wore a talit. You know, I think it's in the book of Matthew, it talks about it too. And we observe all the Jewish holidays. It's just like the Passover, we know the real meaning of the Passover. Uh, Feast of Tabernacles, everything is observed by the Jewish people. So actually, um, it's not a loss, it's a gain, because you gain eternal life and you're still Jewish. It's a gift. Yeah. And, I, and God revealed this to me, I understood it. And um, one day I uh, woke up at 3.30 in the morning and... I, it was a winter day, it was a cold winter day in January, and my whole body was sweating. It was like I was in a sauna or something. My bed was wet, and I was also shaking. It's like, it's like you know, you shake when you're cold. So I was shaking like I was cold, but yet I was all sweaty. And I can't really remember until today if it was a vision or a dream, but I can tell you that I was awake. So I don't know what it was. And there was like a shiny light over my head. And the Lord talked, spoke to me through the light in the language of Hebrew. And he said, Zev, Zev, Yeshua Hua Mashiach, Yishayahu Nun Gimel, is a Mashiach Shel Israel. And that means in English, that means he said, God, I am the Savior, I am the Messiah. The Lord is the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. And Isaiah 53, this is the Messiah of Israel, it's true. And I knew the truth, and I was, I realized that I was a, it was a sinner. A, how would it be a voice that spoke to It was to a it? voice that spoke to me, yes, in Hebrew. It was a voice, and you know, I, I felt electricity going through my body, and it was, it was amazing. I can't even find the words to even explain to you what I went through. And I knew that I was a, you know, a sinner in need of a Savior. I was born again. My heart was changed. Um, I had goosebumps all over my body. And I woke up my wife, Lynn. And I said, Lynn, you know, Yeshua, he's the Messiah of Israel. My wife's first reaction was, you know, go back to sleep. It's the guy from the internet brainwashing me again because she knows years he's been talking to me. And praise God, a, a week later, my wife Lynn received Yeshua as her personal savior. And so this was a supernatural moment in your life and Jesus revealed to you in a very clear and strong way. I, I listened to you, I, I realized without any human intervention. It was totally supernatural. It was amazing, you know. It was just, it was something I've never experienced. I've been, uh, as I told you, an Orthodox Jew most of my life. God never spoke to me. He, like, never, he never spoke to me. Like this. Imagine Isaiah 30, uh, 53, yes. uh, because this is a very key chapter from, from uh, the Old Testament. And uh, uh, how it's received, uh, uh, you as a Jewish, or many Jewish, you cannot take out from the Bible this chapter which speaks very clear about Jesus. We know as a Christian that this is about Jesus. Mm, it's interesting you ask me that question because it's the same question I asked the rabbis, just the way you asked me right now. And 
in uh, in the rabbinic books, there are two uh, two rabbis that address the Isaiah fifty three. One rabbi would be um, Rabbi Radak, and Radak says that this is Israel. It's not talking about a man; it's talking about the land of Israel. But he says that he advises Judaism not to read this chapter because it seems to resemble Jesus Christ, but it's not him. Therefore, don't teach it in the schools and do not read it in the Jewish Haftorahs. Haftorah is uh, the weekly portion of the Bible that's read in synagogues. And uh, when a boy turns 13, he becomes a man and he has a bar mitzvah. And he reads part of the Haftorah. And they never read Isaiah 53. In fact, from 52... They have eliminated it already, and they just don't read it. This happened even now in Israel? It happens now. And Rashi, which is another rabbi, I'm giving you the two rabbis that Israel um, views as very, uh, um, very acceptable. This Rabbi Radak and Rabbi Rashi, they're the interpreters of the Bible. And Rashi says that uh, um, it's Israel, and he explains that Israel will suffer. That's his explanation. For the Isaiah 53? Yes. Um, there was a, um, a rabbi called Rabbi Ben Eliezer, who was in the, in, he wrote the original Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, and he lived 650 years before Christ. And he wrote about Isaiah 53. He wrote that Isaiah 53 is the Messiah of Israel. He wrote it's a man that will will bear all the sins, and he basically wrote that everything about Isaiah 53 that was true. After Jesus came and it was rejected by the Jewish people, they said that what Rabbi Ben Eliezer wrote was wrong, and Rabbi Ben Eliezer was a sick man. There was something wrong with him, and he was ill. Therefore, right now, the Jewish people have eliminated this part of the Talmud. I personally have done research and found this part of the Talmud of Rabbi Ben Eliezer. There is a uh, store, a Bible store in uh, Ben Yudah Street in uh, Tel Aviv, where they sell these Talmud books. And I've asked, can I have a copy of Rabbi Ben Eliezer? And they said, why would you want that? He was an ill man. And I said, I would like it. They said, we can order it for you, but it's difficult to get it. So they've just eliminated it. So they knew who Jesus was. It's after he came that they eliminated it. And this is, uh, the rabbis have done a very good job in doing this. A special Bible here. Do you have the chapter Isaiah 53 in your Bible? Well, first of all, every Bible is special. <laughs> yes, my God. your Bible is also special. Okay, this is uh, maybe you can uh, to see this is a Bible. Bit of the camera. Okay, this is a Bible that okay. I, I bought after I became okay. a believer yes. because it's Old Testament and New Testament. One side is Hebrew, the other side is English. So I can like read the English and, and read the Hebrew and understand. And I can tell you that it's the a difference uh, because in Romania we have few translation, um, but almost are the same. Not uh, myself really. I didn't uh, saw a big difference uh, during many program on being. But in English and Hebrew translation, do you saw a difference sometime? Well, you know the English translation is correct. It is correct because I've read the Hebrew. But you know you can't there's correct no as a gra as a grammar. Let's as say a grammar. As a, yes, but there's some things you cannot translate into English because they're just powerful anointing words. I could tell you that, for example, if you view the Micah 5, which talks about the uh, birth of a king in Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus Christ. Give us an example. Okay. It, I thought it's uh, like a sure. short break in, our, uh, in your testimony, but maybe it's time. And okay. people want to hear a few uh, Jewish uh, verses uh, from your mouth. Okay. okay, the book of Micah 5 talks about... Um, Hold on. Or other? Well, I could just give you the Micah 5, okay? The book, let's say the book of um, Psalms, okay? Let's go to Psalms 2, first of all. Psalms 2 talks about, talks about the birth um, of Jesus Christ. Here we go. Why do the nations range and the people plot in a vain thing? The kings of the earth and themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. 
He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord shall hold them. And then it says over here, Yet you, I have set my king on my holy mount of Zion. I will declare the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I haven't begotten you. Now, my, my son in Hebrew here, um, everything is written in Hebrew except for my son is written Nashku Bar, kiss the son. Today Bar, which Bar is in Aramaic and it means son. And I think that God, um, it's very powerful because as we, we said, we have a Bar Mitzvah. And we use the word in Aramaic for Bar Mitzvah, not, not in Hebrew. Bar Mitzvah is in Aramaic also. And I believe it's a direct reference from, uh, from Psalms 2. And, I've, and, you know, it's just more powerful because you understand that what bar means. Bar means um, a man taking, uh, when a boy turns 13, all his sins and all his, you know, commitments are taken on his shoulder. It, they're no longer on his father's shoulder anymore. And the father, uh, uh, Jesus, said bar and not ben, which is son, because he wanted Jesus to take all the burden of our sins on his shoulder. That is why it's translated in Hebrew, bar, and it's a much more powerful meaning in Hebrew. So it's just, maybe because it's the, you know, the chosen language, the original language, there's a very strong anointment, and I, you know, I praise God and for, you know, for letting me, as a boy, you know, grow in the States, so I have the opportunity to study the English and the Hebrew as well, and I can, I can see this. The difference and the power, the anointing on, on the, the Hebrew power. original. Um, yes, yeah. so there's a very powerful meaning in it. So uh, maybe it was a challenge for our viewers, maybe to understand also to study Bible, not only Romanian language, but also to see the original text, to go back to see maybe additional meanings. So coming back to, to a testimony, what's happened after this uh, strong experience, supernatural experience that you have had, was for you was a clear uh, confirmation that Messiah, Jesus is a Messiah? Yes. yes. And what's, what's after that? How was your relation with your family after that? Well, first of all, I felt so different. You know, the Bible says you're born again. You are born again. You know, you, you, you have the same name. You have the same body. But your, your spirit changed. You're not the same person. Everything has just changed in my life. And, you know, I was excited about it. And when a person is excited, he, he wants to tell people. So, you know, I, I called my, my, my mom. And I told her this. And my mom, she was so angry at me. She said, your father, who was in the grave is twisting and turning from what you have done. You have rejected your Judaism. You have stabbed me and the country of Israel in the back. You are a traitor. And she was very upset at me. Um, I wouldn't chase it. She disconnected me immediately, but she was very upset. My sister, who is very orthodox, who lives in the city of Rehovot, she, um, she disconnected me. I had one conversation with her husband before the disconnection actually about Psalms 2. And he said, you know, you, first of all, you cannot read Psalms 2 in the, in the context because you don't understand it. It's even dangerous to read the Bible, he told me. You need to look at the rabbi uh, uh, interpretations. translation interpretations because if you read the Bible without a rabbi interpretation, you could even die, he told me. It's that dangerous. So there, you know, I don't have an answer for, you know, God wrote the Bible for the simple man to understand. Not for, not for us not to understand. And He got upset, and my sister picked up the phone, and she told me, it's very painful for me, she told me that, um, for me, you're dead. If anybody ever asks me about you, my brother, I'm just going to say, for me, you died. I don't know, like, that everybody will be perse persecuted the way I was persecuted, but I can tell you that there are many, many Jewish people that study the Bible that probably know the truth, and are so scared of it that they just run away. They're scared of what, what I'm going through right now. Um, it's very hard being a Jewish believer in Israel, very hard. It's, uh, Israel is a very small country, and uh, if you're different than they are, and you're from their country, I'm talking about being from their country, you are, uh, you're treated less than a terrorist. And I would, I would be very careful to use that language, but... This is, uh, this is the truth. Uh, in the next uh, part of our discussion, we talk more about your persecution because we have a strong experience. But uh, uh, to, I have a, a few short questions now at the end of this part. To, to turn your, f your face, your, your mind, your th uh, from a traditional Jewish 
Judaism values to Messiah, to Yeshua, to Christ, let's say, means to change uh, your religion. What I don't know how to, how, to, how to ask you. Well, you know the um, because even in many other countries, European countries, uh, to move from a, a, a kind of church to other church means to change your religion. And people are not so comfortable with changing their religion, but at least are between Christian religions. Well, I can tell you that, as I explained, for me, I didn't change my religion. I'm still a Jew, and I talked to this subject with many uh, Jewish people. That I, I don't only talk to rabbis; I talk also to secular people in Israel, and I talk also to Arabs, Muslims. I, uh, I strongly believe that the Lord wants unity in the body of Christ, and He wants the Muslims to be saved as well. And I think that if we're going to have any kind of peace in the Middle East, it's only through Yeshua the Messiah. So I reach out to the Arabs as well. But I could tell you that um, reading the Ten Commandments and saying, God said, you shall have no other gods than me. If we're practicing works, that's idolatry and that's having another God. Now the Jewish people, the way I grew up was, I put on tefillin. Tefillin is, if, is that, you know, the leather that we put here and we write the shin, the name of God here, and we put on our forehead and here. I grew up that you must put this on every day before sundown. If not, you are in trouble. You must pray three times a day. You must, uh, uh, basically, the salvation is in the Jewish man's hand and not in God's hand. It's like a remote control with a TV set. If I do this, I get salvation. Where's God in the picture? So I viewed this as a direct, a direct, you know, breaking the Ten Commandments. So I wouldn't say that I converted from anything. I'm just obeying the Ten Commandments. I'm obeying what God said. That, you know, you should not have any other gods than me. And God... Um, you know, we're saved by God's grace. We don't deserve to be saved. It's a gift from God. But it's a gift that God gives to us out of choice. We have a choice either to, you know, to take the choice or not. I, I have been called a Christian, a, a Goy. A Goy means a Gentile. A Goy, buddy, you're a Goy. You're not Jewish anymore. And you know, that's the way they view me as a Christian right now. They don't... The term Messianic Jew is not something that is acceptable out of the believer, out of, out of the body of Christ. Out of the body of Christ, you are viewed as a Christian. It's only in the body of Christ that you're still Jewish. But nobody would say, you know, you're a Jew, you're a Jew that believes in Jesus. They would say, you're, a, you know, he, you know, he converted, he's a Christian now. So yeah, they, they think I'm a Christian. It's, it's a problem. Um, only the Holy Spirit reveals to us as believers that we're still Jews. It's a, it's a big problem. It's a, it's a big struggle. We talk more in the next uh, discussion about uh, persecution, how you face with different uh, obstacle and uh, rejection. Rese you lost your house, uh, your job. I want to end this part of our discussion. I, I want to, a to ask you, uh, Zev, um, how people talking with you, how they know that you are a Messianic Jewish, how they realize, if they realize. It's something uh, you, you have or do, we don't have kippah on, on your head, or you are having tal talit or not. How do they realize that we are Messianic Jewish? Well, first of all, I always remember um, what Jesus said to his disciples before descending up to the Father. He said, I give you a, a new command to love one another like I have loved you, and do this so that people will know that you are my disciples. And I think that walking around with a t-shirt that says, I'm a Messianic Jew, that doesn't do it. I think that the heart does it, just like what God wants. And reflecting the love of Jesus Christ, that people see that there's something different in me, they would ask questions. This, would, this is your testimony. Our testimony is not only what, how we received Christ, but our walk in Yeshua is our testimony and we have a testimony each day is our testimony and it's not it's not even our testimony it's his testimony and just by being different people will see the difference in you and they will ask you questions and you know I'm talking about Arabs and Jewish secular people and Jewish you know religious people that are not Orthodox this would work about the Orthodox people they would never ask you if you're different because they are isolated you see, um, they don't have internet or TV. If they do have TV, then they watch rabbi videos at the most. 
So there's no way of communicating with them. So this method would not, if you want to like reach an Orthodox Jew, you have to go to his city, go to his street and talk to him. He won't talk to you in the street, uh, especially if you're not religious. Um, but this is a small part of Israel. The other part of Israel, sometimes I would uh, put a talit on, walk in the streets of Tel Aviv or Netanya, and I would not put a yarmulke on. This would attract people because people know that if a person has a talit, he has a yarmulke. And they would come and they would ask me and say, how come you have a talit and you don't have a yarmulke? And then I would sit down and talk to them and explain them that the talit's from the Bible, but the yarmulke is not. And, and they would say, no, the yarmulke is in the Bible. And I would ask him where, and they would say, the rabbi told me. And I said, well, can you please show me a verse in the Bible? And then they realized that there is no verse. And then they start thinking, and then you take their phone number, and you meet them for coffee, and you start get, building a relationship. And, you know, something small like a talit would, would start a discussion, you know? If I did that in an Orthodox city, I'd probably get stoned because it's like I'm spitting in their face by wearing a talit and not putting on a kippah. It's an offense. So I wouldn't do that in an Orthodox city. But in the secular area, it's, very, uh, it's a very good method. This is something the Lord's just showing me.